What started happening is all the protocols would come to us and say, hey, you spend more time looking at incentive programs than anyone else. We want to build an incentive program. Can you help us do that? Biggest takeaway for Missionless is that the apps are actually coming. Like if the first wave of apps in DeFi was like speculative ways to do things in finance, this wave of apps is going to be speculative ways to do things in culture and society. And then most of them are going to be dumb and gimmicky, but a couple of those will become the next Uniswaps and Aves and Compounds. Every conversation that I have at Permissionless ends up coming back to three things, AI, crypto, meme coins, and Deepin. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, I'm here with my co-host, Frédéric Ernst and Sunny Agarwal. We are very pleased to be with Jason Yanowitz, co-founder of BlockWorks and of this fine conference. We're at Permissionless in Salt Lake City. But first, here's our sponsors for the week. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course One. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital, and Ledger, trust Chorus One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at gnosis.io. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Cool. Jason, mm -hmm. thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. How you doing, man? You guys liking the event? It's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's my first time in Salt Lake and my first permissionless, and uh, I was expecting a good conference, and I got a good conference. <laughs> nice. So, good. Yeah. Sonny is not saying he enjoyed it, but that's okay. Oh, I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm sure everybody says this, by the way, when they come on Epicenter, but it's uh, it's actually a very special thing to be on here because this is the show that I listened to for years <laughs> when there were like 50 podcasts in the industry and there was just one I could listen to. So it's a, uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Are you well, excited to have your little polygon picture? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, tell us a bit about this event. Like, uh, what's what's going on here? Yeah, the event is good. It's um, so a couple thousand people here. Um, so events are interesting because they basically la they're a indicator of what the industry was feeling six months ago. Um, because you sell a lot of your sponsorships and a lot of the tickets. Actually, the tickets happened in like the couple weeks before, but a lot of the sponsorships happen and you kind of pick the size of the conference like six months before so uh the event's really good though like we're, we're very happy with it um a couple thousand people here the there's like a lot of founders and uh the i think the conversation is like i don't know a lot of uh, talk about like apps roll-ups uh, our, uh, you know, Uniswap just made their big announcement this week, like with the Unichain, like what's going to happen there. So I don't know. I, I think it's a good event. What's your goal for hosting a conference? Okay. So Blockworks has three sides of the business. We have the media business where we own a lot of the podcasts and the newsletters. Uh, we have the events side of the business where we own two different brands. There's Permissionless and Digital Asset Summit. And then we have a research and data business. So three sides of the business. Actually, we just launched a fourth, mm -hmm. fourth which is BlockWorks Advisory. We'll talk. But uh, all of those kind of sides of the business serve different functions. So the media business um, serves the function of owning this big audience and owning the distribution and the relationship with like millions of people. Then the events business uh, is here to make money, candidly. Like, it spits off cash flow. Uh, and then the 
research and data business does two things, which is it like builds our deeply like crypto native brand and then it drives enterprise value because that's where the like ARR and subscriptions come mm -hmm. from. So if you take those things, like there are some media businesses, there are some event businesses, there are some like research and data platforms, but they all, I think you have to bring those three things together to have actually a viable media and information business in crypto. So they all serve different functions. How did that evolve historically? Kind of, did you start with all those different facets or did you kind of add uh, to, to the offering a bit by bit? Yeah, we built a media company ass backwards. So the way that you're <laughs> supposed to build a media company is you're supposed to launch a Substack or launch a podcast and then maybe you build an audience and then you wake up in like 18 months and you're like, oh my God, I need to monetize this thing. <laughs> so maybe we should host some events or maybe we should get some advertisers for the podcast. Uh, maybe that's what happened with Epicenter. You host a podcast and then you're like, oh, we should make some money and we start getting advertisers. It's kind of a classic model. We didn't know what media was. We didn't know how to do media. So we were just trying to solve one problem in the market, which was in 2017 in New York City, there were all these events, but they were really scammy, pretty mm -hmm. crappy events. I'm sure you guys went to some of these, the like really ICO events in New York. So we were just trying to solve the events in crypto. Mm -hmm. We were just trying to make better events in crypto. And these weren't even big conferences. They mm -hmm. were just like 6 to 10 p.m. happy hours. So we started with the happy hours, turned them into a big events. We initially had this outsourced podcast model where we would like sell ads mm. for other podcasts. For Epicenter? So for, for we Epicenter. sold ads for Epicenter. <laughs> we, during, co during like 2020, 2021? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We launched some other shows. We launched the Pomp podcast, which was called Off the Chain back then. Yeah. We did a show with Ryan Selkis. We did a show with Meltem and Jill um, called What Grinds My Gears. We did right. a show with uh, Scott Melker. We did a show with Charlie Schrem. So we did, had all these sh shows. And then... Uh, COVID hit and 80% of our revenue got wiped out overnight. So that was the basically existential crisis for the business. We were like, do we sell it? We talked to Coindesk. We were like, do we maybe just sell this to them for a couple million bucks? Do we quit? Like, do we pack it up basically? And we just decided, we said, look, there's all these media brands in crypto. There's like The Block and Coindesk and Cointelegraph and Decrypt. But we thought they were all kind of doing a decent job, but not an exceptional job. And the way that we saw it is they're all kind of catering to these like mm -hmm. big audiences. They're, they're shooting for page views and going for like 100 level content or 200 level content. And we said, hey, look, what if you built a media brand just focused on this, on the crypto native audience? Like really just focus on like, honestly, like the three of you in this room as our target audience instead of the random retail per person. And so that's what we did. We decided to hmm. go all in and bet on ourselves, like launch this deeply crypto native media brand. Uh, and that was 2021. So that was when we quit all of our other podcasts. We brought podcasts in house. We launched Bell Curve and Empire and those kind of shows. And then uh, a year later, 2022, we launched the research and data company. So. You you told us just before we started the recording that you were uh, that you were kind of debating internally whether to kind of do it again next year. Um, tell us why you're off two minds about that. Yeah. So. Yeah, we actually haven't really talked about this publicly. I guess we should make some public announcement about it that we're <laughs> <laughs> debating this. But we yeah. can we can also cut this. No, out, no, no, so. no, no, no. This is good. This is good. We, yeah, because I'd love the audience's <laughs> feedback on if we should do this or not. You had it here you, first. <laughs> you know, it's how we get better products. I'll just tell people how we're thinking about it, and someone will give us good feedback. So we have two conference brands. We have Digital Asset Summit, which we call DAS, and it's a very buttoned-up institutional event. It's like traditional, you know, J.P. Morgan. Goldman, KKR, BlackRock, comes to learn about crypto. And there's a very clear, uh, the way that I think about events is you're creating a marketplace for two or three days and then you're tearing down the marketplace. It's actually a pop-up marketplace. So to have a successful event, you need to have a really well-defined sides of the marketplace. So you need buyer, very clear buyers, and you need very clear sellers. So for DAS, a very clear buyer, which is like anyone trying to get in front of an institution, Fireblocks, Anchorage, BitGo, you know, ZK Sync, anyone trying to get a Polygon, trying to sell to enterprise uh, institutions. Then you have the sellers or the, excuse me, the buyers, which are like, I don't know, BNY Mellon looking for like a solution or something like that, or the funds, maybe allocating capital. All right, so that's DAS, beautiful event, tickets sell out once in advance, whatever. We'll always do that event. What we're debating with permissionless is you don't really have that well-defined buyer and seller permissionless. 
it's just like mm. I'd be honestly curious to hear how you guys think about permissionless. But it's just um, we I've always thought of it as like, hey, consensus is not that good of an event because it's just not very crypto native. Uh, ETH Denver is kind of chaotic, but I do love ETH Denver. Uh, token, a they, it's just Asia. It's not in the U.S. And so I've always thought of permissionless as like a deeply crypto native big conference. Mm -hmm. But it's not a very clear who's the buyer and who's the seller. Again, going back to that marketplace idea. So we're debating, do we keep doing permissionless? And because if permissionless is really successful in its strategy today, it ends up becoming like a token. It ends up becoming like a consensus. It becomes like an ETH Denver. And I'm debating the value of big conferences today. Um, the other option we could do is that I think there's a real gap in the developer conferences mm -hmm. uh, in the developer market. So if you look at some of the best developer events, um, you know, ETH Global does amazing work. Uh, let's see, DevCon, obviously incredible, but they're very Ethereum focused. And I think some of the mm -hmm. coolest stuff happening in the industry is actually outside of Ethereum right now, but nobody's built events for that market. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we're, we're debating. Do we just keep going bigger with permissionless? Do we turn it into more of a developer conference? So that's yeah. a little look behind the scenes. And a lot, a lot of the developer events, I think, are more kind of like foundation run or they're closer to the actual chains than run by like, you know, sort of event companies or media companies. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you have Solana Breakpoint and you've got the Avalanche yeah, thing in Argentina. Right, because like they have an incentive mm -hmm. to, you know, fund a hackathon and get a whole bunch of people on their chain. I think yeah, there's, yeah, I think, it, I think it, you know, it, it's, it's complicated. I mean, unless, unless you're writing some kind of like hackathon, you know, as a service sort of business, it's uh, it's hard to create that sort of like momentum around yeah. your kind of developer event. Like our, our thesis for a developer event, that the thing that I think we could do better than anyone is we have an amazing event operations team. So sometimes if you go to these developer conferences, they're not the most well-organized <laughs> events, I would say. We, and we, we know how to run a very buttoned up event. Hmm. Um, and the other thing I think we could do is like, so right now there aren't many new developers coming into the industry. Our thesis is that the number of developers who come into the industry is going to 100x over the next couple of years. And those developers will want a place to go that's a little more open than something like just this is the Ethereum you know, developer event. So like my vision is like, okay, you put like Toby from Shopify uh, on stage with like, you know, Toli from Solana and you put uh, Patrick Collison on stage with like, I don't know, Alex from ZK Sync, like those would be some phenomenal conversations. Uh, the counter is like, you know, look at all these sponsors. Developers don't love having overly sponsored. Events, yes. So you need to make money somehow. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think about that? Well, uh, I mean, you run a developer event. I've, I've tried to do one for the last three years and have been like <laughs> mildly successful with it. You guys run one of the best developers. But I mean, their, their events really, what do you, really what do you think? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's been kind of the main event um, besides ETH Berlin at uh, Berlin Blockchain Week since 2018 when we did it for the first time. Um, I always regret doing it kind of like the, the weekend before I was like, oh, we're such idiots. Why are we putting this on again? Why are we doing this to us? Uh, to Same ourselves? exact feeling. Like, literally, we could go, it's like, screw permissionless. I hate this event. But then you get there. Then you get there and it's actually super nice and kind so of like nice. people yeah. come yeah. and it's kind of like, uh, it's a pretty low key event. So kind of like there's, there's pretty high signal to noise. Kind of the way that we achieve it is kind of like, I mean, we're very much, Gnosis is not an events company, right? So kind of like we run this because we think it should exist and kind of we want to go out kind of with a black zero um, and that's kind of the goal. So yeah. kind of we we don't collect enormous sponsorships. Um, kind of I think our top tier has historically been like 25,000 euros. Um, our our um, tickets are pretty cheap. I think they're like two or 300 euros um, for three days and kind of it includes food and everything. Um, so kind of it's it's not it's not a revenue generating event for sure. Um, but it it does actually create a lot of atmosphere and people love coming and there's a lot of people who actually who are repeat uh, attendees yeah. um, and I think that's for a reason we always have a super nice side event dinner with kind of like uh, the our BFF uh, we, you know friends from the ecosystem right. and so on and it's it's um, it's a thing it's yeah. super nice and for the first time we're actually organizing a side event mm -hmm. to um, to DEFCON this year 
the two days ahead of it called Deaf Conflict. Um, and it's kind of like the, it's the it's yeah, it's kind of like the six di biggest debates in in crypto at this point. So kind of like for instance, the first the first debate is um, my co-founder Martin um, against Vitalik about whether Gnosis should become an L2 and kind of like um, d debates that's like that. Debate. Yeah, that's a yeah. Good so, so what would you do with permissionless? Would you keep doing it as we're doing it, or would you get into the developer event game? Or I actually quite like this. So kind of I enjoy coming because. A, it's very, um, it's mm -hmm. fantastic for meeting stateside people. So kind of like most of the European events or even token, you don't get to see all the Americans. And I don't usually mm -hmm. at these events, I, I, I think as an event organizer, you never like hearing this, but I don't go to a lot of the talks. Um, so kind of because those I can watch on YouTube later. Um, I kind of, I, I literally just network and kind of uh, when I don't have meetings, I sit in the lobby and I run into people. Yeah, and it's kind of like we, I actually love hearing that because my thought, so the content just pulls people in basically. But I mean, we do all these event surveys and stuff. So 78% of attendees attend our conference, attend permissionless specifically for networking, yeah, not right. for content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's not that 22% attends for the content. There's all these other buckets, but 78% attends for the networking. So like, it's, yeah. it's like, um, you know, you, you said that events are like this marketplace and, you know, I think like you said, permissionless style events are not actually a two-sided marketplace. They're like a one-sided marketplace where people are coming to network with each other. Mm -hmm. And then there's this like problem of like, you know, you only want to go if other people you want to talk to want to go. And there's a bootstrapping problem. And I think speaker slots are what you, how you solve the bootstrap problem. That's the bootstrap problem. problem. Exactly. Yeah, you get like, the big name speakers and then you get the big VCs and then the other VCs who are smaller, like, oh my God, these big name speakers, are v my VC yeah. partners are there. I got to be there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about permissionless money? Should we keep doing it how we're doing it now and just make it bigger and better? I mean, you could say that the US, mm -hmm. you know, it's, all, if you look at the event landscape too, all the big events have pulled out of the U.S. Consensus is going to Toronto. I don't oh, think they, they're going to Toronto. <laughs> so there's this massive gap in the market for a huge U.S. conference. Um, so I'm curious how you. I feel. I don't know. I, th I, I feel like okay. So for some context, I've been conferencing for the last three weeks. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> and so because I was in Singapore first, that so I didn't actually go into Token 2049, but I was like. You know, outside it. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for Breakpoint. Breakpoint was exceptional. Yeah. Um, then last week I was at Mainnet. Uh, I'm sorry, Mainnet, which I th felt was I don't know a little depressing, honestly. It, there was no one there, there right? No one That's there. what my team told me that yeah. there was like literally no one attending. And then you, here, you, you said it, not me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I feel so. I hear. I just feel like I think this is more well attended right now than mainnet was but still nowhere as close as like permit uh, uh as uh token token and breakpoint um and i feel but i feel like you know i just feel like right now it's like the third event in a row where i'm like okay it, it's it's a little too generic i mm -hmm. feel that's maybe the the, the challenge where yep. it's like i and maybe what break what like i liked about breakpoint was it was actually very very easy you can very specific yeah, yeah. yeah. so one of the things is like, yeah, I mean, there's nowhere. There's probably one sixth or one seventh the attendees that Token had. Yeah. Um, let's see. I could. You could do the math. I mean, Token had twenty thousand. Yes, yeah, about one sixth of the attendees. So, mm -hmm. uh, but if you actually look back, like our, if you look back at twenty twenty two, that event for us had like several thousand attendees. That was massive. What's the big difference? Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. regulators smashed crypto in the US, <laughs> right? So last year, 40% of our speakers dropped out because their legal team wouldn't tell them they could speak. And most of our big sponsors, even this year, so this year we were able to get the speakers that we wanted, but even our sponsors who sponsor our podcast, our newsletters, our London conference, their legal teams won't let them sponsor a US conference still. Wow. So mm -hmm. that's why you see these events like Consensus Consensus doesn't want to leave the U.S. I don't, I don't actually know, but I would guess they don't want to leave the U.S. But they're they're feeling it, just like all the other U.S. conferences, including ourselves. Or, hmm. you know, we we feel the impact of the regulatory landscape too. Yeah, I, I think what you were saying about um, the event being events being generic is something we've been thinking about also with 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 Nebula. You know, because hmm. like I think one of the takeaways from Nebula this year was was that it was a conference that didn't really know what it was. It didn't know whether it was like a modular conference or a Cosmos conference, and um, 
and and the, the takeaway is that you know we want to create something that's a little bit more uh, targeted and focused on a on a theme, right? I mean, yeah. we're not going to do like an mm-hmm. ecosystem specific conference because that's not like sort of you know our strategy. But doing like sort of more thematic conferences, probably also smaller. Um, so you know, when we had a 500 person event. But even like a two to three hundred person event, I think, um, yeah. makes sense for us. But you know, we're fun, so like we're not running an events business. We're running a different for you guys, yeah, you know, fundraising business. The other, so. the last thing, and then um, the last thing on conferences is one thing you're fighting against as a conference organizer is the fact that all the ecosystems are launching their own conferences. Yeah. yeah. So everybody saw the success of Solana Breakpoint, mm-hmm. and they said, oh, "Well, we need one of those for our ecosystem." <laughs> yeah. So you got an Avalanche hosting their event in Argentina. You got to imagine ZK Singh, yeah. Optimism, Polygon. You got to imagine all these guys are going to do the same thing. So, uh, and like you said, Breakpoint was an amazing event. Like I, I also thought it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you're fighting against that uh, momentum or inertia, depending on how you look at it, as a conference organizer. Yeah. Yeah. What well, we? Um, oh. Yeah. Let, let's talk about Blockworks Advisory. Mm-hmm. You guys just launched that uh, yesterday. I did. Exciting. I did. Uh, some some people did say that they didn't like the name because uh <laughs> advisory is like oh you're getting advisory tokens on the side uh so, okay, so it, that is i was like oh God, we should have thought of that uh no so so basically uh so the story of blockworks like i was saying so like for five years we just did media did media and events and good business whatever and then uh, may 2022 we similar thing to when we launched the media business we looked around and we saw yeah i'm sorry and uh you know I actually don't want to name too many names, but we saw a lot of like research and data providers. We're like, these are solid, but maybe six out of 10, they're not exceptional platforms. We think we can do it better. Um, We don't really want to go build this thing because it's a lot of money and time and you have to hire engineers and that's hard to do as you know very well. Uh, But our customers are are in our clients and our audience are really requesting it, so let's go do it. Okay, so that was May, 2022. We launched the research and data business. We have like 20, 25 like analysts and engineers and stuff like that. And the byproduct of that is that our analysts got, so our analysts got super deep into the weeds. We're the, one of the largest delegates in Uniswap, top five or 10 delegate in Arbitrum. I think the fourth largest or third largest delegate in Wormhole, one of the largest delegates in ZK Sync. So we're like big, we're very deep into the weeds of all these protocols now. What started happening is all the protocols would come to us and say, hey, you're, you spend more time looking at incentive programs than anyone else. We want to build an incentive program. Can you help us do that? Hey, you spend more time looking at grants programs uh, and you, you know, can you, you know, we're Arbitrum. We, we just, you know, we've got this huge grants program. We're worried that we're going to waste all this money. Can you analyze this grants program to see how we should do it? Uh, hey, we're Solana. We, there's no one creating dashboards on us. Can you like, can you help us like get our dashboards out into the, and analytics out into the open? So there's all this stuff like foundation creation, incentive designs, grants programs uh, that we started helping people with over the last year. And that's what we just launched this week was Blockworks Advisory, which is like, I guess in one line, it's helping protocols with growth. That's it. And uh, any, any exciting like launch partners or teams that you're working with? Uh, the initial batch was uh, Uniswap, Athena Labs, Arbitrum, Polygon, Optimism, and Avalanche. Okay, so these are like, you're not like trying to like help like small startups. These are like big projects that kind of you're like... These are the big projects who are sitting on a boatload of capital and have no clue what to do with it. Um, we're also working with some people who would like not publicly sharing their names yet, but who have like TGE coming in the next couple mm-hmm. of months mm-hmm. and they just have no clue how to do it. Like, you know, you're, you're not taught how to launch a token. Yeah. You're, there's no, there's no, I mean, there's no, there's no course out there on how to launch a token. So what you usually ask these teams to do is just like study all the other token launches, but that takes away from you your other work, right? You have to go launch products and keep doing BD. So what we've done is like, we know how to launch a token. Like we've studied all the best token launches. We've studied the incentive programs. We've studied the grants programs. We've studied the go-to-market strategies, and we can help these protocols be more successful. I so that's mm. yeah. And um, like, are you also working with say like with funds that have portfolio companies that want maybe, you know can benefit from this program? Yeah, exactly. So I was speaking with one uh, venture firm. They have fourteen portfolio companies launching tokens in the next five months. So November, December, January, February, March, 
14 tokens are going to launch just from their portfolio companies. And you multiply that by the you know 100 plus funds or whatever funds are in the industry, you're going to see the you're going to see hundreds of new protocols and apps and whatever launch tokens. Um, and so we're working with what who we consider to be kind of the tier ones of of those groups to see if we can help them, yeah, be be more successful and like do honestly do what they do best, which is like build good products and BD and stuff like that. We're trying to take some of the the heavy lifting off their plate. Cool. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, Uniswap. So like Unichain was announced this morning. Were were you guys involved in that at all? Did you uh, participate in? Uh, we weren't involved in Unichain, but we're helping them with some some other governance stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can we can switch gears a little bit and talk about apps and and infra. This was like uh, one of the topics here at the conference. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's your sense of where we're at right now? So yeah, I've got, I I kind of went back and forth on this all year because you know you you go on Twitter and it's like oh my god the applications are coming and and I don't know about you guys but I was like are they. Are they, are they really they though? They are, they are. Are they, I was like, are they really though? And uh, my big, my, honestly, my biggest takeaway for Mission List is that the apps are actually coming. Um, and I think there's a couple things leading to that. So the first thing, I, I, honestly, like a lot of things in crypto, a lot of it comes back to not the users, but the funding mechanisms. So the first thing that's leading to this is, uh, the, there was this model that worked from kind of 2020, 2021 up until 2024, which was you go raise a seed round, a series A, a series B, and then you launch your token and every round is higher. And then your token launches even higher. And that just worked like it, you know, it kind of worked for everybody. And what's starting to happen over the last couple of months is your tokens going live at a valuation that's lower than your last private round. Yep. That breaks the cycle that breaks this model of of doing this. So when you raise your private round at 3 billion and your token goes live at 2 billion, that's not good. Um, and that and that starts to, you know, kind of make the VCs question, should I keep investing in infrastructure? Okay, so that's the first thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is the apps are starting to get funding for the first for kind of the first time. Uh, actually, I'd say the second time. The first we already we already have we already had a big wave of applications, right? It was Uniswap. It was Aave. Like it was it was uh, uh, compound, right? These, these were applications. They were just DeFi applications. Um, so what's happening? So the second thing that's happening is like folks like Infinex and other applications are starting to be able to raise money. Like Infinex raised what 54 million in like a week or two, I think. Uh, that's the second thing. Third thing that's happening is um, the applications are launching tokens. So I think you're going to start to see some of the big applications and the one that kind of everyone has been talking about recently, launch a token soon. Um, and there was a fourth thing, but I, I kind of forget what it is. So uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you guys, so anyways, my, my takeaway is like, there's going to be a, an actual proliferation of applications. Um, some will be hyper, I think a lot of them will be hyper financialized ways to do things in society and culture. Like if the first wave of apps in DeFi was way, was like, speculative ways to do things in finance. This wave of apps is going to be speculative ways to do things in culture and society, like bet on Taylor Swift and, you know, Travis Kelsey getting married or bet on, uh, will Mr. Beast say the word chocolate in his next video? And then most of them are going to be dumb and gimmicky, but a couple of those will become the next Uniswaps and Aves and Compounds. So, but you're, you were saying you agree that there's apps coming? Well, I, I think so. Yeah. So I think if there's no apps coming, um, there's really no, you know, right to existence for this space because kind of you don't need infrastructure for infrastructure's sake, right? And if you want to build applications that are in some respect legitimately useful and usable to real people because otherwise there's no point, right? Um, otherwise, this is going to become, become or stay super niche. So, and I think in principle, we have so much infrastructure that kind of allows us um, to, uh, to offer the kind of user experience that people are used to when, from Web2. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, I mean, just with pass keys and a kind of like account abstraction and kind of like, um, you know, ZK proofs and whatever. So there's so many different parts that you can put together to make something genuinely usable 
and useful to people. So basically, I think we kind of have to take a step back and actually look at why did we start building in this space in the first place, right? Because kind of like building on a truly decentralized stack, it's hard, it's slow, it's expensive. So why do you do it, right? And so the ultimate value propositions that kind of we were thinking about at the time, and I think that should really come into play now, are agency and ownership, mm -hmm. and ultimately also user experience, because kind of like on permissionless platforms, you can build better user experiences than you currently have. But I think kind of that that's still a little bit away, but I think the agency and the ownership, this is something we can do now, and I think this is going to be the, the first wave of apps that really are going to hit the mainstream. Yeah, yeah, I remember the other thing, by the way, which is um, the fourth thing was, you just, like you mentioned before, Uniswap launched their uh, Unichain, right? Is that what they're calling it? They Unichain. Launched, yeah, yeah, they launched Unichain. Mm -hmm. This is like the start of all of these. I mean, I guess you could say TYDX was the start of this, but like this is the start of probably hundreds and then thousands of these app chains happening. So what, what happens when uh, the, the funding is, so, okay, so the funding is rolling over for infrastructure, Applications are starting to raise money. Applications are launching tokens, and applications are launching chains. I mean, that's that's the new that that is the incentive for venture to start investing in applications. Which you'll get a crazy speculative bubble in applications, which is and then that pulls good founders into the industry. It's going to be like Google and Pets.com. You know, they they came about in the same cycle, and it's going to be the same again. And um, yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent, and. I think what we'll also see this cycle is kind of a much more nuanced approach to kind of what part of the stack actually needs what level of decentralization security guarantees because kind of those are things um, kind of like when all the grants run out and so on, those are things you'll have to pay for, right? So kind of really um, looking at it from an engineering and security perspective and evaluating what parts of your stack should sit on what um, on what chain? Yeah. I think that's something that's going to happen for sure too. Sonny, what do you think about this? I don't know. Maybe a little bit more bearish than you guys on this. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, like, I think there's a handful of applications that mm -hmm. I'm like very bullish on, um, and like, but I would say I could probably count them on like two hands. Like what? Bitcoin, prediction markets, perps. Permissionless perp stacks, which is like payments apps, yep. like per, especially the private payments apps. Yeah. And then I think you know that's probably like I guess like dexes and like Bitcoin related dexes. Yeah. Social media. Not bearish. No? Very bearish. Gaming. Very bearish. More more bearish. <laughs> Less bearish on social media. I can see it. I just I just don't think that decentralization on its own is enough. I yeah. think like you need to crack some. Every social media is like new social media paradigm. Like cracks something that like a different form factor that makes it different than everything that came before. Right? Yeah. Like Twitter. Like oh okay, short form content. You know TikTok, short form video. You know Instagram photos. Right? Like I think like. I just feel all the social media stuff today has just been like decentralizing or tokenizing existing form factors. And I like until someone figures out a new form factor, then it'll work. But then I don't see why that discovery of the new form factor necessarily will come from crypto. Or, or if kind of existing alternatives become even more horrible. So kind of like, I mean, I'm the only social media that I use personally mm -hmm. is Twitter. And it's 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 gone downhill so much it's terrible it's it's a really bad user experience so kind of like the um for you real is basically just tiktok like random random videos you can't you can't look away but it's it's horrible and then the the following that's just there's no curation at all obviously and then kind of like that is unusable for me mm -hmm. um, yeah i feel that too so yeah, kind of, yeah. I, I, I want a, a platform where kind of I can have different, different curation algorithms that kind of show me content that I actually want to see. I don't want to. Ha I don't want to. Um, I don't want to have the choice between uh, you know this one curation algorithm or no curation at all. I want curation. I just want the choice of different styles of curation here. And I think um, being able to offer that, and I think everyone's really aggrieved mm -hmm. with Twitter. So I think there is. I, 
Yeah, but yeah. I, I think um, like maybe another way of boiling down is my, my take is like, okay, I think at the end of the day, almost all of crypto is about trading. Um, and so either you're doing like, you know, uh, you're either building a way of trading assets that like bringing in existing assets that maybe are not accessible everywhere and then making them accessible on chain for trading. And I think that's what like things like, you know, permissionless perps markets will end up doing, right? You'll be able to trade US stocks on chain, right? And like give global access to these things, right? So I think that, that that's one. And that, or, or, you know, people being able to trade stable coins or like in countries that don't have access to US dollars. Or the other is you have to invent a new asset type that people can trade. And I think like Bitcoin was an example of inventing a new asset type, I think, these current meme coins are a new asset type. I think prediction markets are this like tokenization of something. And that, that, it, I think it's a new asset type. So I think, you know, it really comes. And I, that's why I kind of agree with your take of like, OK, a lot of it will be speculative around, you know, culture and society. And so I think a lot of like the new growth will come not from necessarily from new. I guess maybe that's the, what, where it's different. Where it's like, I don't know if a lot of it's going to be necessarily new. I think the base action you're going to do is still trading but it's going to be new asset types that are going to be invented hmm. i think the thing that we're all forgetting is how much regulation has handicapped the applications so like how how amazing would it be if uniswap was just able to turn on the fee switch and do things like if you could play with things like that and like we're all forgetting that like we're just we just can't do some of the most innovative unique things not just in like the social apps or prediction markets but like even back in DeFi, like there's all these things that we can't do because the regulation is really tough in the u.s in, in the u.s or even like uh yes. you know i was thinking about this when the when the banks blew up like svb and first republic blew up and everyone was like moving into bitcoin uh, and the and the trading and then like when when trading stuff gets halted as well and like some of the trading platforms shut down then as well and you couldn't trade stocks it's like if we could just trade equities on chain what would that unlock like I I would just stop using my TD Ameritrade or my JP Morgan account and I would just like sit in I don't know I'd like buy my coin stock or I'd buy like my Tesla shares on Uniswap and then put them into Aave and then take a loan out on it. like that. Even that alone is a massive unlock, and we just can't do those things because the, the the administration is not allowing those things to happen, and not just the administration, the SEC and CFTC and stuff. So at the start of the conference, um, you and Mike were up on stage, and you were talking about like the, the kind of three big topics this year, which ties into this, which was a institutional regula in regulatory change, uh, a shift from uh, apps from infra to apps, which we talked about, and new tech. Um, yeah, maybe just dialing in on this institutional and, and regulatory change. Um, what what is your sense of like institutional adoption right now, and what is what is um, kind of leading institutions to adopt crypto, even though the regulatory uh, landscape is, at least in the U.S., is not favorable? So there was this idea, this notion that the ETFs came out. And the institution started buying up all of our Bitcoin and ETH, and we were really happy. And I got to spend a couple of days with um, Samara Cohen, who's the CIO of BlackRock CTF business, before this conference, and she spoke on stage here as well. And she 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 uh, shared this stat, which is somewhere between I, I I'm going to misquote the exact number, but let's call it 70 to 80 percent of people buying BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF. Right, biggest Bitcoin ETF out there. 70 to 80 percent of people buying BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF. That was their first ETF that they had ever bought. Mm. So what does that tell you? This wasn't the e ETFs. This wasn't the institutions buying Bitcoin for the first time. Mm -hmm. These were crypto people <laughs> buying ETFs for their first time. And then they can tokenize it, tokenize them and put them on chain, and then you can buy them on Uniswap. Again. There you go. Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, there you go. Wait, so, why? Why do people do that? Why do crypto people buy Bitcoin what? ETFs? I have no clue. I have no. I have no idea why they Wait, bought these. Is there, ETFs. is there a tax advantage of having in? Like yeah, you could put in yeah, you could put in your Roth IRA, four hundred one k, something like that. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's a reason. Um, there's probably a lot of people like, I don't know, my dad or something who like likes Bitcoin but like just doesn't want to deal with the hassle of like. I don't know, private keys or something like that, or even like maybe a scared of Coinbase was like, oh, great, I can buy it through my Charles Schwab account. 
probably a lot of people like that, self-directed uh, folks. But I still think this idea that like, oh, the institutions are here. I mean, there's there's only two public pensions that have openly bought Bitcoin. It's uh, Wisconsin and, and one other. We're like 1% of the way there. And I don't think it's because they don't, and it, you know, you asked me a couple of years ago, it's a couple of years ago, it's because they don't believe in this stuff. Now it's because the regulatory risk is too high for them to take the risk. But if there was different regulations and it was clear if these things were securities or commodities, then, then I think there's, there's, there's a massive flood of capital that comes in. That's why I think people are really underestimating just how crazy 2025 can get. Like if there is a administrative change or even if you know Kamala gets elected but like shows that she's pro crypto or whatever, uh, the I like you know Bitcoin could be at 150k before we yeah you know, before we know it. And what does that do to alts and to meme coins and to the industry? Like I, I think people are really underestimating how quickly that could happen. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with that. I I think that whatever happens after the elections, I mean, you know, we're, we're fundraising, right? And like, as as a VC, and I've talked to a lot of VCs, there's there's a um, a lot of institutions and LPs are reluctant to deploy right now just because of the kind of lack of clarity. I mean, not it's, even, it's not because they don't want to deploy. It's, right. It's, it's just there's there's like uncertainty in the, yeah. uh, in the markets right now. And and I think whatever happens, whether it's Trump or Kamala. Um, at least like, okay, now there's no more uncertainty. We know sort of what the kind of you know, roadmap is right. moving forward and that will lead more investors to, you know, sort of. By the way, re Republican or Democrat, crypt crypto, I think will boom in 2025. I think crypto is going to have an extraordinary year in 2025, a year that will look very similar to maybe the middle to late half of 2020 mm -hmm. or, you know, early 2021. I think it will be really crazy. It's just does it happen in the United States or not, is the question. It, to me, it's not a question of, will 2025 be good for crypto, bad for crypto? It's going to be, an, uh, I think, a really crazy, amazing year for crypto. It's just, will that success flow through the United States or will it throw, flow through you know, Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong and other places? Yeah, it's not flowing through Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, no. Is, the, the pendulum has swung to Asia and it's going to swing right back to the US. By the way, as it does for <laughs> as, it, it as it has Europe. for years. Like, this is a new thing. Like, yeah. remember, the US was super hot. Then it went to China. Then China shut down Bitcoin mining. Then it went back to the US. And then regulatory space. Now it's in China. It's going to come back. Yeah. And EU regulators are twiddling their thumbs with regulatory mm -hmm. frameworks. There that you go. I'm also Nobody bullish on the big EU. exchange. I mean, like, look, I, like, I think. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, but I, I think the EU framework will, uh, Mika will enable so like Binance and Coinbase and large players to come and establish their offices in Europe and like start selling to retail in Europe. But for startups and projects that are just launching or, you know, even semi established like decentralized projects like Gnosis, the compliance cost is like super high, right? Like, I mean, we're talking about, you know, half a million to a million a year possibly just for compliance? Well, <clears throat> it depends on how you build your depth, right? Kind of like, so we've, we've traditionally and are still doing that, have built our DAP such that um, they are maximally decentralized and they fall out of scope for this sort of regulation, except for where it explicitly had to fall in scope. Um, for instance, kind of because you have, uh, you integrate with off ramps like Visa or yeah. IBAN and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that last thing uh, that we didn't talk about is the new tech. And so um, I think, you know, you mentioned ZK and AI. Um, yeah. What are you most excited about? Um, so ZK, I'm a little torn on. So I did, I spent the, the weekend before we got here with um, the ZK Sync team. And we had a lot of ZK conversations at Permissionless. And it feels like it's just starting to, the products are just starting to hit the market, right? Like you saw Optimism uh, and uh, who, who they partnered with, Succinct. Um, you know, you got to imagine Arbitrum is racing to do either probably build versus buy question. Like, I don't know what they're doing, but probably some racing for some sort of ZK thing. ZK Sync is like obviously making a big push. You've got Polygons like ZK EVM. Like it feels like they're starting to finally push live products. 
I'm a little more skeptical. Like, I think we're probably a year, a year out from, I think if you take this, if this stuff starts hitting market too quickly, you're probably making some compromises that you don't want, that you shouldn't make. Um, but I do think it's getting closer to being real. Uh, AI crypto, I have no intelligent takes here. I'm like, <laughs> I'd, I'd be talking out of my ass, I think. But it does. But I, what I will say is every conversation that I have at Permissionless ends up coming back to three things. AI crypto, meme coins, and Deepin. For some reason, every conversation and historically at conferences, uh, you can if you have a co you can kind of see where conversations flow to, and like usually every year there's like two or three things that things flow. Every conversation eventually gets to, and this year it's Deepin, AI crypto, and meme coins. So, the other thing that's interesting this year is um that is happening right now under our noses that nobody seems to be talking about is a change in the stablecoin markets. So right now there's Tether and USDC. And uh, I, re I really am curious to get your guys' takes on this. So there's, there's uh, kind of three buckets of stablecoins. Actually, there's really two buckets of stablecoins right now. There, there's folks like USDC and Tether, where they kind of keep all the yield. And then there's an, uh, another bucket. It's called bucket number three, which uh, they folks who are thinking about passing the yield on to directly to users. The... There's a new bucket that is starting to emerge where they are passing the yield onto the businesses that hold their stablecoin, right? Exchanges and custodians and saying, hey, you figure out the yield. And the reason this is uh, super interesting is the problem that's happening with folks like USDC. So the problem with Tether is a lot of folks are offboarding Tether right now. The problem with USDC is that a lot of the custodians uh, and exchanges uh, basically, well, there's two problems. One of, one of them is the whole industry competes with Coinbase. And if you hold USDC, you know, whether you're an L1 and L2 and you're minting it or a, a custodian or an exchange, you're funding your competitor in Coinbase. The second thing is um, if you, let's say you're a, I don't know, you could be an exchange and you hold like billions of dollars of USDC, you usually don't get any of that yield, right? That goes to Circle and sometimes to Coinbase as well. Uh, and then the problem with the third bucket of these stable coins that pass on the yield directly to users is, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but probably security, it, so it sounds like. So there's this new bucket, you know, you saw BitGo launch a stable coin called, I think, USDS. Um, Nick Van Eck launched Agora, I think it's called. So what they're doing is, uh, and all these new stable coins are doing is they're passing, they're, le they're basically saying, hey, we get 5% on this, but custodian or exchange, you decide what to do with the yield. We're gonna take like 25 bips or like, I don't know, 100 bips or something. We'll pass the other 4% on to you. You can keep the 4%, you could, you could pass the 2% on to your users, keep 2%, you could pass all of it over to your users. And I think that is, uh, that model is either going to shake up the market share of the stablecoin market, or it's going to force Coinbase and Tether's hand to change things. Coinbase and Tether do actually pass on some of the year to um, to the exchanges that kind of um, that kind of hold um, the I mean not not everything but 25 bips but like half or so. So uh, Yeah, so like yeah, if you like if I hold USDC in my Coinbase account, I'll, I'll get some of that. I think the bigger problem is that everybody competes with Coinbase. Sure. So if you're Anchorage or your BitGo, or your Fireblocks, or your Copper, or you're an exchange, and you're holding a bunch of USDC, you're, you're inadvertently funding Coinbase. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> sure, I am. Yeah. And I think, yeah, like, you know, I, I hold USDC on Coinbase, mostly just because it, uh, like, it, it's easy, yeah. and, and it gives that yield. I guess the other thing, though, but the nice thing about USDC on Coinbase is it's one-to-one -one transferable to my bank account, and it's it's USDC. It's it's what's already most liquid in DeFi as well. So the I, I, USDC is in a pretty like strong yeah, they're in spot, a good spot there. Yeah, so yeah. it'll be. Yeah, I, I think what will end up happening is it might end up forcing. Uh, I think it probably USDC. forces their hand. I think USDC probably their market share remains massive. Yeah, but it probably forces their hand. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how quickly that forcing of the hand happens with their race to go public, right? There's this, so it's an interesting dynamic that's happening in the stablecoin market. So you think that like, they'll be forced to start giving up some of that yield to- More of the yield, I yeah, would say. That's right. what I would guess. How, how, and the, the counter take on this is that fees can remain high, higher longer than people think. So for years, people have been saying, 
Coinbase's fees on retail are going to come down. Coinbase's business is going to get crushed because fees will come down. I can assure you fees have not come down on that thing, right? <laughs> like, you go, you know, go trade on the retail platform on Coinbase. Fees are high. So fees can remain high, much high, much longer than the market thinks that they should. Yeah. I want to talk about podcasting a little bit. Um, you, a little while back, I think maybe like a year or two ago, you put out this tweet, which was, I'm going to like butcher this, but like, basically the lessons you learned from launching a successful podcast. And uh, do you remember this? No, but we could talk about it. <laughs> always, da always dangerous. If you pull back my tweets longer than like two weeks ago. So. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like Blockworks, hey, you know, has a company has been really successful, but you know, your podcasts have been also I think, yeah. enormously successful. I think Blockworks or empire okay. is consistently in the top two or three crypto podcasts now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's huge. Um, that, that's a position we once held. <laughs> <laughs> a oh, tear falls out oh, of his those eyes. Are the days. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, I mean, what's, what's your key to success here? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, first of all, you guys know that with the podcasting game, the only way to grow a podcast is just doing it over and over and over again for a very long amount of time. And we've been doing that. Yeah. <laughs> check. Yeah. Check. Mm -hmm. Check. Uh, 10 years. 11. You guys have been hosting this for 11 <laughs> yeah. years. Yeah, That's 11 remarkable. Years That's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you guys have gone on for, to, the difference is you've gone on to bigger and better things. We're still stuck <laughs> podcasting, right? You guys figured out that podcasting is a tough business. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, we own, for those who don't know, like Empire, Bell Curve, On the Margin, Ford Guidance, Lightspeed, uh, Expansion, mm -hmm. like all, all these podcasts. We Thousand have, X. Thousand X. Love that podcast, yeah. Uh, Joan and Avi are going to get mad. I didn't mention them. Uh, I'm sure, I'm forgetting some others too. But we have a we have copied basically the Barstool Sports playbook. Um, so Barstool, uh, I don't know if you guys do. You guys know Barstool? Mm -hmm. No. Wow, you Europeans, <laughs> that is remarkable. Do you know who Dave Portnoy is? No. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was that okay, for me. That's yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, they are. Actually, I don't even need. To, okay, we copied a, a, a successful podcast model of another media company, where basically the model is you have a one host who's full time internal and one big name host externally, yeah. and we've so the hardest part about podcasts is growing a show because a lot of other uh, mediums mm -hmm. and content mediums, you have native growth mm -hmm. baked into it, right? You have native ways to grow a channel and there's an algorithm that will promote you. There's no algorithm in Spotify and app or there is a Spotify and Apple algorithm, but like you don't get native growth inside of those platforms. Maybe sometimes Spotify, if they see that I listen to empire, so they're going to promote empire to me, but it's very, very, very minimal. Um, compare that to something like YouTube where you can just mm -hmm. get in someone's feed, uh, very, very different, right? So the hardest part is growth with a podcast. The way that we've kind of hacked that growth is with, uh, it comes down to the hosts. So we have one full-time host internally. They're basically the PL owner. They're the operator of the business. They, they, run, they run the podcast. Then there's another host who's the KOL, we could call it in crypto, right? right? They're the influencer, they're the big name. So let's, uh, let's look at a couple Blockworks podcasts. So you've got, for Empire, you've got me, I'm the boring guy who knows nothing. <laughs> And we've got, but I can run the show. Then we've got Santiago, who is the, you know, mm -hmm. the KOL. We've got Lightspeed, right? We've got Jack Kubinick, who's a reporter for Blockworks. He's the host. He kind of runs the whole show, makes the wheels run on time. And then we've got Mert, right? This like, kind of KOL. We've got uh, Bel mm -hmm. Belcurve mm -hmm. podcast. Mike mm -hmm. is my co-founder. He runs Belcurve. But then we've got Michael and Brant Vance, you know, big name investors at Framework Ventures. They help drive growth to the show. And, you know, put that, put that model on repeat um, and, and, you know, kind of the, the, the list goes on with our shows. So that, that's our model. Um, that's been really helpful for growth. And uh, the, other, the other thing is, I think we have a, a hack basically, which is once you get one podcast that's successful, it serves as a launch pad for the other shows. Yeah. And it starts to build this really nice uh, flywheel effect of the shows growing other shows and like cross promoting other shows and Mike will come on empire and I'll go on Lightspeed and Lightspeed will come on e expansion and creates this really nice uh, feedback loop. How do you make sure you have enough like content differentiation amongst them between them? Uh, great question. So eat. So the way that we actually have structured our whole content business is 
uh, comes, it comes back to a thesis that we have around media, which is there's two ways to build a successful media company, super niche or super big. Mm -hmm. So super big would be like New York Times, very successful, Bloomberg, very successful, Fox, very successful. Um, uh, even someone like Business Insider doing very well right now. Then there's very niche, which is, uh, you know, crypto, uh, basically like deeply B2B media um, where you're targeting a really, really, really niche audience. The dangerous place for media companies is when you fall in the messy middle, when you get too big that you're no longer niche and you start targeting a generalized audience. So that's what was happening to Blockworks, right? We'd been around for like five years. So we launched internally, we call it kind of like Project House of Brands, where, we're, where Blockworks sits up here and it's almost like an LVMH model where we now have sub brands that cater to a unique audience inside of crypto. Oh, the other podcast I forgot was Xerox Research. I knew that was for you. Um, <laughs> David's going to be mad. <laughs> yeah, sorry to the research guys. Uh, so what we've done is, so let's say there's a, who, who's a strong community inside of, uh, inside of crypto? The research analyst, the analyst crowd, the research crowd, kind of nerdy, like loves getting into the weeds, reading the long reports. We have a newsletter for them called Xerox Research. We have a podcast for them called Xerox Research. That's a brand, Xerox Research brand. Uh, who's another community, Solana community, really strong community. We've got the Lightspeed brand for them. Uh, the founder community, right? That's Empire. Um, the kind of like modular, like expan expansion community. That's the expansion brand, right? Podcast, newsletter. So we actually build, we think of these as actually mini media companies under the broader umbrella of Blockworks. It's super funny because Empire is the one I listen to and uh, kind of uh, I, 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 I'm adhering to my category. You are in the category, <laughs> yeah. Sonny, do you listen to any of them? Uh, I listen to Xerox Research and Bell Curve sometimes. Nice. That's what we want. I listen to Empire mostly, yeah. I, 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 do, I do listen to thousand x and then realize like just how much of a horrible trader i am uh, you know but like i just always learn a lot listen to those guys i really like this you know this idea of having sort of the the hosts and then like the kol and you know we were talking about this earlier like when you're hosting a podcast like i, I was thinking about this recently in in 11 years of podcasting i've retained surprisingly little information because you know when you're when you're hosting a podcast at least for me you're very much in the weeds of trying to make the show engaging and interesting. And you're sort of like thinking about what's my next question? How do I bounce back on this, et cetera? And having two people um, really helps because, and especially if you have this role, right? Like these roles are clearly defined where one person, in, in case of Empire, you sort of direct the conversation. And then Santi can go on and he can just like, right. you know, do his thing. He doesn't have to think about that. And, and, and you sort of like reel things back, you know, take the conversation in another direction and you're sort of, you know, curating the conversation. Not to say that you don't bring no, yeah, good insights, I, like, but you, you do have that role of kind of acting as the host with this other host and perhaps like a guest. That's right? exactly. So I don't know if people listen to the all in podcast, but yeah. Jason Calcanis gets a bunch of shit yeah. because he's not as interesting as the other guys, but that show wouldn't exist if they didn't have a Jason Calcanis. Yeah. So yeah. you need someone to drive the conversation forward and basically moderate it. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? No. All right. No. Let's, we're, we're done driving the conversation forward. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's button this up. Let's Thanks. Button uh, it up. I appreciate you guys coming to Permissionless. It means a lot. And yeah, honestly, uh, very fun to be on this podcast as a, someone who's been listening for not 11 years, but probably, yeah, eight, eight or nine years now. So very that's, cool. That's pretty OG. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it, guys. Mm -hmm.